larger, more broad audience than I, I normally talk to. I was down at the Geologic Society of America had their West Coast meeting a few weeks ago and gave a talk there, and it was about this many people, but they're all like hardcore geologists trying to shoot me down. And, uh, <laughs> hopefully, you guys are all friends. Um, so, uh, what I'm going to be talking about today is, is uh, primarily focused on the Easton Glacier, some of the glaciers on Baker, but Easton is the main one I've been focusing on for the last 20 years or so. Um, and uh, a lot of what I'm doing here to get a, a, a hit from the, uh, the uh, my colleagues up here that I list up here, this involves a lot of work that other students have done at Western as well as a whole host of other collaborators that I've had um, from all sorts of different universities and locations um, who've worked up in the same area. So what I'm presenting to you is not strictly my own work. Um, I've been involved in most of it in some fashion, but um, in, in some way I've always had help with other people. It's very collaborative. Um, set of work we've been doing up there. And there's some other projects that I, I didn't have time to like put in here too that I've been working on up on, on the mountain. So this is just a snapshot of what I've been doing around East specifically. Um, not really knowing everyone's background, I figured I'd, I'd start by running through a few Mount Baker stats just to sort of uh, get everyone on the same page of what this mountain is all about. Um, it's got a series of named glaciers and some smaller unnamed glaciers. But fundamentally, it's the most heavily glaciated, uh, currently glaciated volcano outside of Mount Rainier um, in the Cascades, going all the way from Shasta down in the south up to Garibaldi up north. So that's a, that's a pretty good deal. Um, it's uh, the volcano itself, the edifice of Mount Baker, was largely built in the last 100,000 years or so. Um, and the main cone apparently started forming roughly around 40,000 to 30,000 years ago, most of it from during the Ice Age. Um, so it's very young, geologically, um, and a lot, not a lot is known about some of those earlier eruptive events. Um, it's mostly what we've got information on are the most recent eruptions since the end of the Ice Age, um, that uh, the last few eruptions, it hasn't been that active for the most part during the last 10,000 years, but it has had some activity. There was a, right after the large glaciers left, the scene, or just as they were leaving, Summit Crater apparently had a significant eruption that built the Carmelo Crater, the Summit Crater, up at the top of the the top of the, um, the mountain. That, that's what you basically climb over when you're on the wall. Um, about uh, 10,000, 9,000 years ago, Shriver's Meadow Syndrome, which is off the side, it's not actually on the main edifice of the mountain, um, on the southwest side, was erupted in a big lava flow, salt and lava flow, flowed all the way down to the Baker Lake. Um, and that's a really interesting thing you can look at. It's a whole story in it itself. Um, about halfway through the whole scene, about six and a half year, thousand years ago, Sherman Crater, which is the main crater that you see from the, uh, from the west. When you look up there, there's sort of the main summit cone. And there's a sort of side cone. There's a Sherman Peak. The divot in between is Sherman Crater. Um, and that's, that uh, had an eruption about six and a half, seven year, 7 thousand years ago. And that was the last real eruption that the Bakers had. Um, on this timeline here. And then the only thing that's really happened since then have been some steam explosions um, out of Sherman Crater also. Um, one that happened in 1843 with some subsidiary uh, lahars that came down off the mountain in the 1800s. And then in 1975, it had another sort of steam event. If you look up online, what happened with that? It's uh, <coughs> confusing what was actually going on. But this predated Mount St. Helens' major eruption in 1980. And so for a while, Mount Baker had all the attention of the USGS in terms of which is going to be the next volcano to erupt. Um, and then that got just put in the back burner as soon as St. Helen popped up. stop. But I'm a glacial geologist, so I'm going to start with sort of the glacial story. And again, just to get everyone on the same page, um, going back in relatively deep time for most folks, not for geologists, but for most folks, um, if you go back to the peak of the last glacial maximum in the northwest, uh, known as the Vashon glaciation, um, there was a huge ice sheet up in Canada, the Cordier Ice Sheet, and on the west side of the Cordier Ice Sheet, it said about 19,000 years ago, um, a large advance started up north of the border. It crossed over the border, just north of Bellingham, and it made its way all the way down past Olympia um, by about 17,000 years ago and then retreated again very rapidly um, so that basically this whole area was deglaciated by about 15,000 years ago. So it was a very rapid advance for a glacier and then retreat again. But that advance and retreat fundamentally reshaped the entire Puget Sound and the, the Salish Sea area. Um, 
And most waveforms we see there now um, are a result of that big glaciation. Uh, in terms of Mount Baker, the interesting thing about that is this, this, I was really searching for a map that showed this. And not many of these, most of these type of Puget Low maps, if you look online, they sort of just show the outer edge and take everything's under ice up, up above it, um, up to the north. But that wasn't true. Baker definitely stepped, poked out um, by a few thousand feet. Um, the Twin Sisters probably just poked out as well. And Shuxon all poked out. But almost everything else was completely overrun by the ice. Table Mountain, if you've been up to the uh, end of Mount Baker Highway, Table Mountain has striations right up to the top of Table Mountain. So that whole thing got overridden <coughs> by that ice sheet at max. Um, so Baker poked out but not by a lot. And that ice would have completely reset the hill slopes around it. So all the glacial evidence we see on its slopes now, even related to the maximum um, about 70,000 years ago, or something since then, so all very young glacial deposits. If you go down, sort of out along the edges of where that Petit Low went, you can see lots of older glaciation um, uh, deposits down here. But we only have very young stuff up here, or gel. Okay, so let's go take a look at um, Mount Baker specifically. So this is a, a LIDAR, hill shade, oblique view of Baker. Um, and we're looking at the sort of the west, southwest side of Baker. There's a summit up there. There's Sherman Peak and there's Sherman Craters right there. That's the summit, uh, Carmelo Crater that erupted right into the Pleistocene. Um, and this is Deming Glacier coming down here and then the Eastern Glacier, which I'll be focusing on right here. Um, about, so by 14, 15,000 years ago, the big ice sheet left the scene and you would have had something like what we have now, which is basically uh, the volcano. It almost certainly still had uh, mountain glaciers on it at that point, but we really have no information about how big they were at that time, right after the big ice sheet melted away. Um, so we don't have a lot of information on that. The first information we have about what happened uh, with glaciers on Baker was about 13 to 11,500 years ago, an interval that affected much of the northern hemisphere called the Younger Dryas event, which is a return to more glacial conditions um, around much at least the northern hemisphere um, happened in. The glaciers on Mount Baker, there's, no one studied this in detail. This is only sort of a, a very small part of some of the studies I've worked on with various collaborators. And we, we know where that, those glaciers reached to below the Demi, and to some extent over towards Easton, but it's not as well known over here, which is why I'm showing you the Demi Glacier for this one. Um, but this blue outline that you see over here roughly outlines the extent of that glacier. You can see these moraines that come down. It's clearly a valley glacier. It's not related to the big ice sheet glacier. Um, and it overlaps all the, these uh, segments down here are all related to the big um, Pleistocene maximum glacier, the ice sheet. So these things sit on top of that. They have really nice valley forms. And I don't know if you guys can see it, those little ridges there, those linear ridges, those are all related to that glacier dance. Okay. So that was a, a cold period that affected the northwest, caused whatever the glaciers were before to advance out to basically their maximum since they haven't gone past that since that time, 11 and a half thousand years ago. And just for comparison, the, the maximum for the whole scene in the last 10,000 years um, are only a little bit smaller. So, um, the, this red line indicates how big the glaciers were just about 150, 170 years ago. Um, so glaciers back uh, it just recently have gotten quite close to how big they were right at the end of the Pleistocene. But these ones are always pretty much a little bit bigger. And you can see these deposits related to this advance all over the North Cascades. I've had numerous students, students working on that glacier advance other places around the North Cascades. Um, but everywhere we see it around the North Cascades, and actually most of the western U.S. and Canada, this advance was just slightly bigger than the biggest Holocene glacier advance. Okay. So that's sort of setting the stage at the beginning of sort of the modern climate era. Between 11,000 to 6,000 years ago, there's really almost no information about what glaciers were doing in around Baker, or for that matter, anywhere in the uh, Cascades. Um, there's all we can say is that the glaciers were basically similar to or possibly smaller than modern, we don't really know, um, but they could have been smaller than modern. There's just no evidence. It's a you know, lack of any moraines that were there got overridden by subsequent advances and got destroyed. Okay. Let's see if I've got this memory that I had. Somewhere in here I did have a link. 
All right, so, so moving forward in time, you know, we have this blank period from 11 to 6,000 years ago. Um, and then after that, we, have, uh, we start seeing some signs on, in the deposits on the mountain that the glaciers on, on Mount Baker started to re-advance right around the first little blip we see in the deposits is about 6,000 years ago. There seems to have been a small advance. This is a little chart here showing the age going from 13,000 years ago to, to today. Um, and that's that younger Dryas event I, I told you about, the end of the Pleistocene. Here's the blank period. And what this thing is showing you is, is the relative size of the glaciers from minimum to maximum, maximum being where that younger Dryas glacier was. And what you see here is a little blip about 6,000 years ago. It's definitely a smaller glacier than, than later on and earlier. But there's a little uh, hints of that advance in various glaciers around Baker. And then not much going on that we can see. We think the glaciers were probably close to that, but we don't know. We don't see any evidence of that. Um, and it's not until sort of later in the whole scene, the last two to 3,000 years, where we see a series of advances affecting not just Easton, but all the glaciers that we've studied around Mount Baker. And just to give you an idea of what some of that evidence is, um, this is the Eastern Glacier here. This is the Eastern Glacier, and this is called the Fourfield Trough down where the glacier, when it got bigger again in the late Holocene, it advanced way down past this picture. But there's a couple places on the inside of those moraines. You go know, hike up there, you can see some little stripes, these, this stratigraphy, geologists call stratigraphy, these layers in this hill slopes inside the, these moraines here, and if you go and look at those things up close, what you see with those is that, so that little box there is this area zoomed in, is that what we have there is a buried soil. So it was a, a surface, it was the surface of a moraine at some point. That soil actually has some uh, Mount Baker ashes, that 6,000 year old ash is on it, or a little more than 6,000, 6,500, 7,000 year old ash. And then on top of it, it's got some other little bits of ash, and then it's got a whole bunch of trees and logs and stuff that are then buried by a younger moraine over it. And so our interpretation is that by dating the logs on this, we can actually see that that was a period where a glacier came down in this period here, buried it with um, new till, could be pushed out by the glacier over the old moraine, and you've got a buried forest there, you can date that, and that's, our, that's where we have these hints of a subsequent early Holocene or middle Holocene glacier advances through here. And it turns out there are some other younger ones that are even higher up, which is where we get some of these other advances. So even though the glacier overran its own moraines and basically destroyed them or buried them, and there's a few places to get these peak blue views into what used to be there, what used to be the landscape, covered them by subsequent bigger advances. So we have these little hints, and that's where you have to go and um, you know, hang your butt over these ridiculously unstable slopes. And unfortunately, I was not the one doing that. Um, they would actually, the folks I was working with, that was that long list of other folks. Um, some of them like to repel off stuff like this, so they get somebody up here, they go you know, drop down this thing with helmets on. And I don't think helmet would it'll actually help you very much if one of these giant boulders came rolling down to you. But except they, they did that on their own recognizance. <laughs> okay, so um, giving you a slightly different view going on to Eastern Glacier. What we're seeing here is that um, the interesting thing that is that at Mount Baker, at the Eastern Glacier, almost all the glaciers around Mount Baker, and pretty much everywhere in the Western U.S., the biggest glaciation, glacial advance of the entire whole thing, the entire post Pleistocene period, happened only about 150, 170, 170 years ago, um, about 1850. And so all these white brains you see here outlined are basically where the glacier was in 1850. So just before people really started going up into the mountains around here, settlers were down Bellingham, um, but the glacier was much bigger. It was almost actually more than two kilometers longer for Eastern Glacier than it is now. And that's a dramatic change in climate to have it shrink that much, which is what I'll spend a fair amount of talking about, how it went from this to that. Um, but you can see that rain limit all over the place. This is roughly where that younger Dryas rain limit is too, um, on that side. Not as well constrained over here, though, for that one. So, um, a few years back, a friend of mine, John Skirlock, um, did you guys know John? He's a, a mountain photographer, um, and his main type of photography is he supplies his own home-built airplane around the Cascades. And 
take spectacular photos of the Cascades and of the glaciers and of the mountain peaks. So if you guys ever want to go see some amazing photos of mountains, just Google Skirlock. It's usually the first thing that pops up. Um, but he's, he gives them, he gives them out free. He does some good books too, by the way. Don't get into that. But one of the things he did uh, in 2012, um, he had found a while before he found uh, an old historic photo from 1912 um, by J.D. Welsh, and uh, it was taken from a nearby peak. This isn't from a, this isn't a near photo. This is taken from a nearby peak, and so he went up there with some other folks. Um, I wasn't able to join him on that, but they, they bushwhacked it up to the top of this peak, and it is not an easy scramble by all accounts. They actually failed the first time getting up there. But they wanted to go and reoccupy that site with the same sort of camera lens setup and retake this photograph of um, Mount Baker and of the Eastern Glacier that's shown here in 1912. And interesting about this photo, first of all, you can see those moraines that I was just showing you over here. That's the Metcalf Moraine Railroad Gate right over here. Um, so the glacier clearly has, is not at its maximum. It's, it's less, it's already shrunk away from the maximum, but there's a hint right down here, just poking out from behind this nearby peak, uh, that the glacier ice reaches all the way down to this level down there. That's pretty important because that's like the first earliest photograph we have with a terminal position um, on that glacier. In fact, uh, Monica Villegas, who is one of Andy Buck's students, um, but Andy Bob is going to be out here working on um, this exact retreat um, in the next <coughs> coming summer. So there's a very interesting study that will be going on. You guys should pay attention or stay tuned for that one. But this, I mean, what I'm going to do is I'll hit the button here and it'll fade from this photo to the, to the 2012 photo. So that's at two kilometers of retreat in 100 years. It's foreshortened here, so it doesn't look as big as it is when you're actually walking up it. Um, but if you walk up it, it's a long haul to get up from where that terminus is down here, and it's several thousand feet of, of climb. Let's see what I've got here. That's not what's supposed to come up. Right. So, okay, let's look at some other historical, photo of the historical retreat. Um, so here's 1916. Of the east end. And this one's, I, mean, I don't have the same perspective on all these ones. They're all sort of different viewpoints. So it's a little bit hard to tell what's in the foreground, what's in the background. But 1916, the glacier was still pretty big. It hadn't retreated that much yet from that uh, 1912 photo. It's not too surprising, only 40 years. There's 1935, further away. By 1935, that glacier had shortened quite a bit. So remember in uh, 1912, it was all the way down here. It looks like, and it's a little hard to tell, but it's retreated probably almost a kilometer, by just within a few, a decade and a half or so. 1952. In the sort of tough perspective, there's a lot of snow on the ground still, so it's a little hard to tell, but you know, the glacier's in there somewhere. Turns out 1952 is, was a period of uh, onset of retreat. And then 79, looking straight on, and this is an interesting time period because uh, at this point, this, the glacier here is actually bigger than it was here. Um, I'll show you some evidence for that in a second. Here. And then here's a viewpoint from 1988. Just again, these random photos that are found on the web or from other resources. Um, but let's take a look at a little more rigorous view of what was going on with the glacier. So between 19, uh, 1850, and about 1950, the glacier retreated probably more than two kilometers. It retreated dramatically. But there was actually a re advance that happened between about 1960 and 1988, um, which is interesting because at the same time, other glaciers around the northwest and the western US were still retreating. But the eastern <coughs> glacier in 1956 retreated <coughs> way back up the mountain um, up here in between 56 and 1977, 80 or so. It re-advanced about three to four hundred meters. Is that right? Yeah. Three or four hundred meters. Um, I haven't actually measured this out. But one thing I did do was this time this one should work. Well, I'm going to go. This is
So you can, one of these great things you can do with Google Earth is you can go and drape a map like that onto the modern glacier. So here's, here's basically the modern glacier here, um, as of like uh, 2016. Here's Harper's map draped over, and it may be a little hard to tell. And I, I tried to sit there and stretch around and make sure it fit as best I could, but I didn't have a ton of time. So, um, so here's that 1987 advance, or 1980 advance, I would say, matching down here. Here's roughly where it is now. If you look at the 1956 line that Joel Harper, this is work of, of a former master student at Western, said, in 1956, the glacier was actually smaller than it is currently. So the glacier retreated back and re-advanced by several hundred meters, and since then it's been retreating back again, um, but still hasn't gotten as small as it was in the 50s. So interesting thing there, right? We sort of, you know, I've always tend to think that it's more of a monotonic retreat of glaciers since the 1850s. That's not true everywhere, and especially with some of the bigger glaciers in the Cascades. They have a more variable um, reflection of climate. And one of the things that Joel was curious about was why, why was that happening? And he, first of all, documented that not only was Eastern Glacier went through this advance, here's all the glaciers on, on Mount Baker, re-advanced by hundreds of meters during the same interval. And so one of the questions is, well, what was going on with glaciers? They were getting healthier again. They were growing. That was sort of an encouraging thing, right? Um, and what he, he, he went and compiled a bunch of climatic data for Whatcom County um, and through that same time period. And what he found was that the period when all the glaciers on Baker were advancing between about 1960 and 1980-ish. Um, it's not obvious. You look at the, the wiggle lines here. Like the temperature and precipitation are kind of bouncing all over the place between interannual variability. But what he concluded was that that period of all glaciers advancing and slightly before, because glaciers take a while to respond to climate, usually on the order of about 10 to 15 years, I think, for these glaciers. Um, the period preceding and moving into that zone of advance, things the temperature overall was somewhat cooler, overall with a few exceptions, and precipitation was quite a bit higher. And that combination of higher winter precip and cooler temperatures helps that glacier respond by growing. And since then, things have been warming back up again. I think it's dominantly warming um, that has caused the ice to start retreating. There's a, some historic photos uh, I found, I can't remember whose photo this is, um, but uh, off, stolen off the web somewhere. So here's the glacier in 1977, which is right about at the peak of that one big advance. This, this glacier shows all the signs of an advancing glacier with the big crevassed front, big angular, chopped up, and that's when a glacier is advancing, it's, advanced, it's moving so fast, it's outpacing the melting, and those fractures open up because it's expanding as it moves down slope. It's all fractured like that and very steep and hard to walk on. Um, that's a classic sign of an advancing glacier. It's building a moraine out in front of it out here. Um, and I found one of my own photos from one of my field trips that I'll show you some more of uh, in a second. Um, that's pretty close to the same position. And I sort of muck around with it to see if I can line it up. So that's 2015. Almost the same viewpoint. It's not quite the same viewpoint, but um, it's pretty close. So that's you know, a few decades of retreat. From that, we advance. And then I've been taking field classes on field trips up there most years, not every year, um, for the last two decades. Uh, I'm teaching a glacier geology class here. And every fall, first weekend of the quarter, we go, we hike up to Eastern Glacier and spend some time looking at the ice and looking at the landforms. But one of the things I've been doing is just taking repeat photos from various places, they're not, I haven't been systematic. I you know, kind of kick myself now after all this time we've going up there. I never sort of thought I'd be, keep going to the same places all the time. Um, but I do have some sets that are close. So bear with me on this. Let's go take a look at this. Um, you'll see sort of this historical cornucopia of photos. This is uh, 2000, the first time I took a class up there. And you can kind of get a sense, uh, the uh, digital cameras kind of suck back then compared to now, right? They're all green photos and it's just Color is terrible. Um, but it was interesting to look at the terminus here of the glacier. It's fairly boldy, it's not, but it's not really crevassed that much. It's kind of smooth slope. That's usually the sign of a glacier that's retreating overall, um, or maybe, maybe in equilibrium, but uh, it's not really advancing in this case. It's 
2000, or 2001. And it's, again, you're getting different perspectives here, but this, this photo, this next photo, is sort of looking at this same area right there from a slightly different view. And I don't know if you notice that that, that same area here, that's this, this cliff figures prominently in the next few photos. The ice is a bit more cracked up, a bit, a bit steeper, a bit more bulgy. And here's a view, again, sort of grainy, um, from one of the moraines looking back at this. Again, you start seeing there's some crevasses starting to develop that weren't there the previous year. 2002, that same bulging ice over the cliff has started falling over the top, over the edge. We actually had ice ball, big ice blocks, and we're dropping off the glacier up here. And one numbskull student went crawling up around here with that stuff overhanging his head. <laughs> um, this was a very wet day. We definitely got soaked on this one. Um, there's a different view of that, that collapse. Um, and then uh, my uh, colleague Scott Lenneman, and you guys know Scott? He, uh, he had a big beast of a dog along, Max. <laughs> Max is a, uh, let's see, he's a great schnauzer slash <coughs> Newfoundland mix. This dog was about a 170 pound dog. Except at this point he was about an eight month old, starving, 100 pound puppy. So he was like wolfing everything. Like, everyone looked away at all, he would eat their lunch. And uh, the students were lost like three lunches that day. <laughs> um, and we got snow on the way out. 2003, much better weather. But check out the ice front here. It's this big fractured mess, and you could not get up there without ice axe and crampons. So yeah, here's what it looked like. You could have they had ice caves at the terminus. You walk in there, and you're frozen chicken on your uh, your ice axe. But this was an amazing thing. You won't see this at all if you go up there now. I'll show you some photos of what it looks like now. But this was incredible. We had these big ice caves you walk into at the terminus through these where basically there's crevasses opening up on the, on the floor. Um, and again, from the side, you can see some of those things we were just in. The photo I just showed you was in one of these guys right there. But big fractured um, terminus. This is a bulging, advancing terminus right now. 2004, grass is still there, but look, they're starting to get more muted all of a sudden. There's still some big grass there, but they're getting muted. The slope isn't quite big. That big grass isn't open there yet. So we started retreating again. 2005, Here's that same cliff that had the ice fall below it. Now the ice is back off of it. Um, still fairly bold. You couldn't really get on this easily without crampons and ice axes. But um, it was definitely very much had retreated between a few meters to tens of meters, depending on where you were. 2006, the front is starting to get, those guys are getting even more muted three times. 2007, we got snowed out. Didn't get up there. Um, 2008, the terminus now, there's almost no grass. The terminus, you can just walk up on the ice at this point. You started walking up it where it could for about three or four years. 2008 there from the brain looking back. 2009, so some of these, these tongues here and here have, have shrunk pretty dramatically. From that. 2010, we got rained on. You know, we still get up there. But you can just walk right on the ice. So this is the amazing thing. Like, there, there was no grasses at all. You just walk right under it with shoes. You didn't need crampons. You didn't need ice. You just walk up it. There's enough dirt and rubble on the ice. It's not slippery. And then you just walk up it. Yeah, we're just dumping right on this. Um, there's students just walking around on it. 2011, same thing. This was a fairly heavy snow year. So even though this was September, there's still snow left over from the previous winter. 2013. 2015. I, I have no idea what happened when I came on this one. Those rocks don't actually look like that. <laughs> <laughs> like Mars all of a sudden or something like that. <laughs> it's, it's like somehow I didn't like the light. Those, those are uh, oxidized boulders. Um, so 2015, this is I think my most recent photo from up there because I haven't been up there for a couple of uh, um, summers at this point. But basically again, you can see us walk right back up onto it. Um, and there was just there's tons of rubble on it, but it's an easy hike to go hike around on. Um, there's a few places I've got actual repeats of this pretty close to the same site. So here's you know, 2003 versus 2011. Those are the only two competitors. So here's that. This is 2003 is about the maximum for this little advance. This is a small advance. It's not a huge one like the 1980 one. Um, small advance and so it's all cracked up, big crevasses, everything bulging. And this this glacier is just ripping on down the, the slope. Um, 
and by 2011, that's what we're So there's that cliff of the ice blocks coming off it, and now it's behind, it's well back from about 100 meters or 200 meters. 2001, and Glaciologist by training, I'm a geologist, and, and it's interesting that uh, in addition to the glaciers changing, some of the rains are changing too, the deposits. So this is a, a just happenstance. I wasn't thinking about this when I took these photos. I just happened to take it from very close to the same period. So this is 2001, 2000, I think it's 2003 here. Um, so here's the Marine Crest of Railroad Great. The trail goes right down the crest there. And you know, take note of some of the, you know, the shape of the crest through here. Um, and then uh, the next one is 2011. Same rain. I don't see any differences. <coughs> there's not, it's, it's a little hard to tell. There's, a, there's just a couple. So keep your eye on that boulder. That's a big boulder. So, um, this, these moraines are evolving and they're, they're changing through time, they're collapsing through time, they're relaxing because this slope here is so steep. You know, loose sediment does not like that slope. It wants this nice angle to close down here. So presumably this whole ridge line will slowly collapse down until the whole slope is this angle. Yeah. Well, and that's, that gets heavy uh, snow on the others. Yeah. 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 Although uh, hopefully it one did not fold her off. It could have. I mean, the trail goes right along there, so people are yeah. throwing rocks off it all the time, too. But the snow of yours come in there and they try to get straight up. Yeah. Yeah. They highlight it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, we, we actually get in for some of the work on top of with snowmobiles, so um, I, I, I appreciate they, they get access to this, but yeah, they, they definitely change the landscape some for sure. Um, okay, so just quickly summarizing. <coughs> um, what we have is the, the outer yellow line this is from Maury Pelto's web page, another guy who's been just studying the glaciers up here. Um, so here's that little ice age maximum 1850 moraine sequence out here. Um, and so 150 years or 170 years ago, here's where it was. And here it is up here, and here's sort of that uh, last little bit from 1980 going back to the modern retreat. Um, signs are that this is, there's, there's no slowing down this. The, the recent stuff that I've been seeing from all my time going up there since from 2000 until now is basically pretty steady retreat from about 2003 on. Um, and there's no sign that there's a re-advance coming again at this point. At some point there probably will be, but we don't see that happening. Um, that brings me to this one other, like the, the one study I do want to talk about in a little more detail than just sort of the pictures thing. And this is um, a study that one of my current students, uh, Eliza Kimberly, is doing, and uh, she'll be finishing up hopefully this summer. But it's, it's studying a, a ma new method of trying to do, track what's called glacier mass balance, which is a way of tracking the inputs and outputs on a glacier, which is a way of measuring its health. How healthy is a glacier? Um, is it going to be growing or is it shrinking through time? And by how much? Well, I know in terms of mass. Okay, and so the idea behind mass balance is that all glaciers have um, some combination of accumulation zones where the higher parts of the glacier are adding excess snow every year, year in and year out. That snow compacts into ice. When the ice gets thick enough, it starts flowing down slope until it's low enough that more snow and ice melt every year than accumulate, and it reaches some balance where it's adding ice up here and it's losing ice down here, and in steady state, that would just always stay in the same place. If the accumulation decreases, the glacier will start retreating. If this area gets bigger or more snow comes in, it'll start re-advancing. And so glaciologists love to try and figure out ways to measure that so you can quantify it, not just have by, say, looking at a picture, but actually figure out how much extra mass are you gaining, how much extra mass are you losing uh, through time. 
And the traditional method, the, the main method that glaciologists have used for 100 years or more um, for this is they'll go and install a series of ablation stakes into the snow and down into the ice. They'll drill holes in the snow and ice, install those stakes, um, measure how much snow there is at the peak of accumulation, around here that's typically May um, on our glaciers. So you go up there in the middle of the late spring, put in these stakes, measure how much snow there is, measure the position of those stakes, and then come back at the end of the summer, the end of the melt season, just before the first snow of the next winter, and measure those same stakes and find out if there's any snow left over or how much. And usually on the lower part, um, not only have you lost all the snow, but you've lost some amount of ice too, and you measure how much that is too. Right? And it's, this uh, method is very laborious. You have to get up there and um, get up on the glacier, various levels on all the way up the glacier, by skiing or by snowmobile. Um, you have to bring something you can melt a hole in the snow and ice with. And we get really thick snow around here. So the thing that the National Park uses, and we're borrowing theirs here, is this little thing looks like a backpackable espresso machine. Um, it's, it's, it's really, really high-tech, it isn't that high-tech. It's basically a, a butane burner and a tank of water. And you fill out full of water, melt water from the snow, um, heat it up with a propane tank, uh, with a heater, not later it's on your backpack. Um, and then it has a hose, that is a high pressure steam hose, and you put that onto a nozzle at the end and just drop it down into the snow. It melts its way through the snow, and with the ablation sticks, you've got to get the ice too, because you can't, you want to make sure if all the snow melts and ends in the ice, you've got, you've got your stake stays in place no matter what. If it falls over, it melts out, you're done. Um, so you have to do this with every single hole, and it usually takes a couple days to install those stakes on a given glacier with a lot of you know, backbreaking work. Um, and uh, my student, Liza, uh, did this, this uh, last year, not this last, two years ago, uh, went and installed five different stakes up the Eastern Glacier to some pretty hairy crevasse fields up here even, um, and uh, came back and, and tracked their measurements. And the way this traditional method works with, say, five points like this, you have to take that one point, whatever, how much ice you lose at one point, and assume that the, a certain swath of the glacier has experienced the same amount of accumulation or ablation. So here's the, you know, state one, there's the swath, you get whatever value you get from state one. State two, there's the swath, you get whatever. Comes out of that state, three, four, and five, and then I don't have the swaths that she has there. But you're basically making a great, great <coughs> assumption that <coughs> one point of ablation and one point applies to a big band of ablation. Um, even, so even this is, given all the work here, you still are pretty approximate to what might be going on. So uh, what Liza's main part of her thesis is, try and compare that traditional method to a new method using drones and a new computer technology called Structure for Motion, which is a technology where by using a whole series of photos, it doesn't have to be drone photos, you, know, you can use this with almost anything. You, you want to like, make a, a map of a teapot. You just take a bunch of photos on the ground around your teapot. But the basic idea behind this is that you get a whole bunch of camera angles of a given surface. And if you know all the parameters about the lens of the camera itself, the resolution of it, and you know a few other um, technicalities about positions of certain specific points, you can create an incredibly high resolution, photorealistic digital elevation model of anything, like your pumpkin. Like there's, there's, you can go online and do structural motion of a jack lantern and you can see people jack lanterns in 3D. Um, with something like a glacier, it's a, it's a bit more complex than that. You've, uh, you've got to basically develop a flight plan. So this um, map over here, it's a little bit low resolution, but I don't know if you guys can see all these little pink lines going back and forth across there, and there's a bunch of blue lines over here. Those are all the flight lines pre-programmed uh, for a drone that a, a professor named David Sheen at the University of Washington has been doing on the East End and parts of the Deming for the last four or five years. Um, he's been going up there both spring and fall and flying and reflying those sections of the glacier with a drone, taking photos of it. Um, you have to have some ground truthing, so this little uh, <coughs> square right there is a, a target that you have to use a GPS system to find out exactly where that point is in space. And that will be in the drone imagery. And that will, you, you can use about 10 or 12 of those things to tie into sort of a universal grid so you know exactly where every point in that whole DEM is. And that allows you to Created high resolution DEM in the spring, maximum accumulation, and a similar one for the fall, maximum ablation, and you can compare.
compare the two, the difference one from the other. Um, so that's what I'll show you in a second. So, oops. I'll turn that off. Go back. Let me just. Uh, so, I should be in my office if we have one thing here. So, so what we've got here is two different um, drone-based structural motion DEMs of the Eastern Glacier, the tongue, only the tongue or the toe of the Eastern Glacier. Um, here's Liza's three states that she had approximations for. Um, this one on the, on the left side is maximum <coughs> accumulation of snow for the winter of 2018. Um, and what you see here is basically the color coding here is uh, blue, light blue is zero accumulation and pink is up to 10 meters. This is in meters. So getting 10 meters of snow is kind of a normal thing on our glacier up there. So where you see these, these pink and purple, those are getting up to 10 meters. There's a few places where it's relatively low, but most of it is in sort of the five to eight meter amount of snow that was accumulated that, that winter. And then this one over here is the fall one, the fall um, uh, map subtracted from this. They only were able to fly the lower two zones for that one. They didn't get the upper zone for battery reasons. Um, but what you see here is how much mass was lost. In this case, they lost up to 12 meters of snow and ice over the course of that summer. And you can see there's, there's a lot of variability here. So remember, the traditional method has each stake, whatever that stake is, whatever you measure there, goes for the whole section. Instead, when you look at this, there's a huge amount of complexity in there. Um, and so one of the things that Liz is working on right now is comparing her results to the results from this and seeing how different the amount of mass that gets recorded by a drone that's doing super high resolution imagery compared to a traditional method, are they close, or they are not even close, is one actually better than the other? And it's not guaranteed that the drone is better, because the drone has some issues, which I'll mention here. Okay, so remember, that, uh, this is basically what I said, that you know, the traditional method is just big zones. Here, it's every little pixel matters. And then you can get down, these pixel sizes are about five centimeters. So, conclusion on this, we don't have it yet. But she's still working on it, so stay tuned. She is supposed to depend on the ball, though. So if you guys pay attention, that's a public um, presentation she'll have here on campus, uh, where she will basically summarize whatever we end up finding from this. But she's right in the midst of making these calculations, and they're not simple, um, turns out. There are some ongoing problems that we have to solve. This is part of the issues going on here. Um, there's definitely battery power limitations for the drone. Um, the, as good as drones are getting, glaciers are big. It can't be eastern glaciers, really big. Trying to get a drone up to the higher parts of a glacier takes a lot of battery power, and they don't really have it yet. Um, not sufficiently. You'd have to actually hike halfway up the glacier, at least, or two thirds up the glacier, and um, uh, fly a drone from well, well higher up the glacier. And that defeats part of the purpose of having a drone. We want to have it so that it's uh, the drone is an easy way to go and take compete measurements for a whole glacier in high resolution compared to getting out there and having to hike up the glacier. You have to hike up the glacier with a drone, that's kind of... Um, one of the things you notice in this, this difference image here is you can really see the crevasses in there. And crevasses are not a simple thing to deal with because snow falls in them to some extent, but they don't get filled up with snow every, every winter. They get bridged over. So then what happens in the melt-off? Does it fall, does some snow fall in the crevasse? Is that adding mass? Is it subtracting mass? It's a hard thing to figure out. Um, we haven't figured that one out yet. Uh, glaciers flow. And so part of the difference from the first image to the second one here is just the fact that the glacier is flowing downhill. And so something was a hole like a crevasse before, and now the, the crevasse has moved down slope. It's you know, by 10 meters or something like that over the course of the winter. So you know that. Um, there's something we just found out about called emergence velocity. So in the ablation zone of the glacier, the ice isn't just flowing downhill, it's also coming up in the surface and getting you know, melting away. So as it melts away in the surface, ice comes up from below and replaces it. And we have to figure that one out too, because that could be meters of ice um, that we're not accounting for. 
um, and others. So we're we're getting a lot of stuff. Um, so just to summarize really quickly, because I'm it's a tad turn. Uh, glaciers of Mount Baker have a largely coherent history over the course of the whole scene in terms of what they're doing. Um, as best we can tell, uh, the whole scene maximum breach everywhere. The last 10,000, 12,000 years was about 170 years ago, about 1850. Um, since then, the glaciers have retreated dramatically. They probably lost up about 50% of their volume on right Mount Baker. Um, that's a lot. So even though their length hasn't increased by 50% of their volume, they've, got, they've thinned down in addition to retreating. Um, that's a lot of water flow of ice that we depend on and various species depend on that sort of meltwater. Um, despite some periodic minor advances, the main trend is pretty, pretty consistent with a few pickups here and there. Um, there are definitely some new methods coming on to track glacier chains, like structure for motion. They're quite promising, but they're still, they need to be tested out a bit more and, and proven that they work. And so stay tuned for that. Um, and uh, I think there's a lot of promise in this, but we're still working on it. So um, stay tuned on that one. I think it's, this is something that, there's a, one of the things that David Sheen is working on is doing structural motion using satellite imagery. So it gets down to like the sub-meter scale on glaciers, and that might solve the drone issue automatically. You just do it from a satellite. Um, so that's, that's another promising method. Um, so I'll just leave this. And I'll take any questions you guys have. Let's sit there to help the dog. And that's uh, that's uh, 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 one of her uh, helpers out with you. So thank you very much for.